Beethoven Sonata, C minor, Opus 13, Pathetic, one of the most famous Beethoven Sonatas, uh, just next to Moonlight, to uh, Appassionata, to Waldstein. Um, and everybody who ever played the piano uh, for sure tried uh, at least the second movement uh, or the beginning of the second movement to get his grandmother to tears. And uh, well, Callum from Manchester, now we have in our talks, we have the first uh, real English talking and uh, uh, it's kind of, kind of lesson of good English pronunciation and uh, I feel very guilty for my English, but now we can hear the right English. And uh, Callum is 19 years and uh, well, as you can read everywhere, that this sonata is a kind of emotional explosion and a very s strong uh, um, um, espressivo and uh, feelings and w uh, a lot of other things. Um, you are young, so you are full of power. We could hear it in your performance. Uh, what do you think about this sonata? How do you feel it? And how you invest yourself into this music? Well, I've played this sonata since I was about 12 or 13 years old. And, I mean, it's a piece that sort of even people that don't play the piano love. It has that immediate quality. It was immediately successful when Beethoven wrote it, age mm -hmm. 27. And, and, it, and it still today, it has this direct, uh, immediate mm -hmm. power. Um, various things I, that struck me about um, rediscovering it for this production um, is the real orchestral quality. Um, obviously, we find this in all Beethoven, but mm -hmm. especially in his first movement, um, many parts almost unpianistic. It sounds almost like a piano reduction of an orchestral mm -hmm. score. Um, and this introduction is so famous. Everybody knows those first three chords and these three great um, pillars that sort of set the sonata off. And these three statements are separate. There's silence in between. Mm -hmm. And so it's a challenge to connect them and so that they make a logical progression from to the next one. And then finally more. And so these big sort of, you could imagine the full orchestra playing um, is responded by almost uh, perhaps woodwind or just the violin, violas, and maybe just cellos. And it's in this orchestral nature that the entire piece unfolds, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this grave is a kind of introduction, but uh, in a way it is part of the thematic material of the whole movement because mm. uh, it comes again and again. And uh, what do you think? Uh, is it a, a preparation? It's a curtain open? Or is it uh, part of the idea of this first movement? Oh, I th it's both, I think, because th it isn't just that we are introduced like in Opus uh, 111. We have this theme which then comes back before the development section in G minor. And then finally before um, the code or the final um, few bars, we have these pleading chords which return for the third and final time. And so I think it, these, the grave sections clearly mark mm -hmm. each section mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and really defines the structure very yeah. clearly. Uh, and uh, there have been discussions about um, the repeat in the exposition and uh, there are some sources who uh, argue uh, for repeating the grave. Maybe a little bit like the discussion uh, in the last years about the beginning of uh, Chopin's B-flat minor sonata. Mm. What do you think? H have you tried in concert both versions? Um, well, actually, in the B-flat minor sonata, I've played that um, quite often, and I I'm convinced uh, I prefer going back to... Mm -hmm. 
Um, but many people do go back to the opening. Mm -hmm. um, and I personally prefer the, the traditional way, mm -hmm. um, but who am I to say? So? Well, one, one, one could do it, one could try it out. Yes, for sure, yeah. Uh, not good would be uh, to do it three times. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, then the, the uh, Allegro con brio section, mm. what do you think? Is there, is there a limit of tempo or um, like uh, Tzu Yu said in her interpretation to Opus 28, the major sonata, uh, you have just to feel it and then do what you feel in the moment. Mm. Uh, what, what do you think? <coughs> I think it's about finding that balance between, I mean, this opening theme from the Allegro mm -hmm. is so energetic and he writes Allegro Moto um, con Brio with vigor. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it's flying up the keyboard going Um, and so there's many recordings where they go even as fast as... Um, and so I think it's entirely up to the performer, but I personally try and find a balance between um, excitement and this almost flashes of lightning as it mm -hmm. flies up, yeah. and also having yeah. poise and restraint, which yeah. is the real challenge in this Allegro. And we, we have to have in mind that it's still a classical sonata, so sure. of course in Con Brio it would be possible and uh, uh, imaginable uh, to, to do an accelerando there and to prepare the sforzato and, and really speed mm. up, but maybe this would be too much. It, yes, I think it would be, because Beethoven is for sure has this great difficulty of being on the border between classical mm -hmm. and romantic. There's many romantic elements, but it is always in mm -hmm. a classical form. Yeah. Um, even in his later sonatas, there's always a strict form. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think it really is about finding that balance, yeah. I think. And uh, what do you think about uh, uh, passages like this? Um, we had in two years uh, discussion, uh, we had uh, the tema here. And uh, this is an earlier sonata. Should one play uh, the accompaniment note uh, more clear? Should one point them out, maybe even, to have the energy? I think the energy is in the, um, is in the harmony and also in the top line. And then it continues on into staccato. That mm -hmm. is when I think it becomes more clear. Here I think he has slurs on the lower notes and um, I think it sounds uh, this is simply an accompaniment. Yeah. So this is after bar um, 89 and follow. Mm. Yeah. And um, well, the, this interruption of uh, the, the Allegro con brio by the grave, so this is a quite important moment. Mm. And. Uh, we have the fermatas, so you think one should take long fermatas and, and wait a, l a long time to prepare and also to hold the tension. Yes. Uh, second movement, the all-time hit. Uh, what do you think? Uh, very interesting, and I, I would just like to point out again, there is one book by Joachim Kaiser, who was a famous uh, critic of uh, the Süddeutsche Zeitung. And he was himself a very good pianist. I often heard him in Munich talking about Beethoven sonatas with a piano on stage and playing something. It was, it was very good. And uh, he discusses uh, several possibilities. This book on the Beethoven sonatas is about 40 years, so he discusses the famous pianist at this time, but still is a, uh, a book which really is a milestone mm. in interpretation and I would recommend it strongly. Um, he writes the, uh, about the different possibilities just um, to put out the melody and to bring out Deutsche Cantabile or even to show this kind of second violin or viola doing uh, uh, the um, accompaniment mm -hmm. or maybe even uh, uh, later bring it out when there comes triplets. What do you think? Um, I think 
for sure it is very much like a string quartet. It's very clearly written um, with that in mind. Mm -hmm. um, I think the main um, thing to really think about um, is quality of tone of the of the main voice. Um, and to really, that's the thing that we're all searching for is this singing tone that is warm. Um, for instance, Ben Mazevich, a great hero of mine, mm -hmm. is um, an absolute exemplar of this. Mm -hmm. um, and so often I would practice this slow movement um, as a almost chorale mm -hmm. to search for the warmer tone. Mm -hmm. Can you show? go through the entire piece like yeah. that. Can you do it now with the original accompaniment? Yeah, and just as an alternative, uh, could you show how it sounds if you do a little bit more the inner voices? I've always thought of the inner voices as they're, of course, they're essential because they give movement, otherwise it would just be crotchets. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there it's almost a sighing, um, and so that it shouldn't be equal, it shouldn't be, yeah. it should be more, perhaps. I think if you point out this accompanying notes too much, then you lose the feeling for the adagio. Uh, yeah. I think the adagio really should follow the melody, and mm. this is the, the moment which creates the adagio. Um, how is this in the middle section when it turns to minor and mm. we have this uh, kind of staccati uh, with sforzati? Uh, what do you think? Sh should one think about uh, the, the first movement and really play it? Uh, with strong expression, pathetic, or...? Uh, I think this is another world away from the pathos and um, dramatic nature of the first. I think this is, of course, perhaps more sorrowful, and we have this long... in the upper voice. And simply, again, perhaps second violin and viola just going... Again, providing movement and a... And it's this combination that of stillness and yet slight movement mm -hmm. which is the key to the whole yeah. piece and finding again that yeah, balance yeah. Um, but again I think it should be in the background maybe yeah, yeah. So. and so this movement uh, after this exploding first movement gives also the audience a chance to rest a little bit and not only to rest but to dream maybe oh, uh? yeah, really so I in a way it's early Beethoven, uh, so he was 27, 28. Yeah. You must imagine here in the Mozarteum, a young student comes in with his score and says, look what I wrote, mm. and this is Beethoven. And, uh, but I think one can already call this one of the first romantic pieces. Yes, it, in, in terms of mood and atmosphere, it is absolutely very romantic, and especially um, when we go from Yes. And the whole atmosphere of this entire slow yeah. movement is really yeah. very romantic. And yeah. it's about really how it comes back three times, yeah. Yeah. always in A-flat major, yeah. and but each time uh, slightly changed. And yeah. it's so, what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. And you could sing more um, or try and do slightly different phrasing or get an even longer line mm -hmm. or perhaps show certain different yeah. elements of the harmony. And from the knowledge of the romantic uh, period, uh, Schubert's C minor sonata is a very uh, similar beginning. Um, well, we, we know how to do sometimes a kind of rubato. Mm. And I think with this knowledge, we cannot ignore this. And so it, it, it will be uh, almost there. And uh, well, even if you have an orchestra with uh, uh, baroque uh, strings, 
uh, you maybe do a very nice rehearsal and then you go out and with your mo mobile phone you call the taxi. So uh, it is a uh, different time, but of course we have to have it in mind, I think, that is romantic. And uh, But not too much, of course. Of course. Uh, what do you think of the third movement? Uh, the so third movement? A um, kind of rondo, it's coming again and again. Mm. And uh, mm. how about the tempo? Well, it's only written allegro, and mm -hmm. so, I mean, what does allegro mean? It's not 126 beats mm -hmm. per minute. It's completely um, subjective. Yeah. Um, I think this movement is a lot lighter mm -hmm. in character compared to the first movement, mm -hmm. which is so intense and dramatic. But would you think this is still under a uh, certain pressure, or it is just uh, relaxing and playing no. with some uh, really wonderful ideas of articulation mm. and phrasing? Oh, no, for sure there's many dramatic moments in it, and especially in the coda, towards the end, mm -hmm. it gets remarkably dramatic. Um, and I think, again, thinking about um, connecting bars and getting a long line, um, whilst having a certain um, poise and uh, restraint. It always reminds me of from Beethoven's third concerto. How that comes yes, back. Yes, yes. Um, and so the tempo, um, I mean, many recordings, they go. And then some. Mm -hmm. um, I went for a um, slightly more um, quicker tempo. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been a great um, joy and difficulty yeah. <laughs> getting to know this final movement yeah. again. And, and how about the sforzati and the chords? Uh, should they be really a uh, kind of um, uh, memory of the first movement and oh. point them out very strong? Or should they fit in this little bit relaxed atmosphere? I wouldn't say it's a, r a relaxed atmosphere. I'd say it's there's certainly tension and you can in a diminished seventh, and uh, um, but the, the sound I think uh, should be, of course it's Fort Santo, uh, but it should also be round and yeah. not um, like a punch or a yeah. or a yeah. hammer. It yeah. should be more, and then yes. Um, there is one point uh, which we discussed. And um, I think there are uh, a lot of different possibilities. I, I would just like to show it. It's, it's um, bar 170, uh, this Calando. Mm. And uh, one really could uh, uh, think, where is the end of the Calando? Is this this? And starts it like this, or is the G? It's the upbeat for the new tempo. Uh, could you show this both possibilities? I, al I always don't know what to do because I think both possibilities are wonderful. Um. Yeah, this would, when you hold it a little bit, I would it hold it even more, mm -hmm. big formata, and uh, uh, try to do a tempo there. Yeah. So this would be a, this yeah. would be the upbeat, but in the bus, I think both possibilities are there, and um, I really cannot decide it after even after years. <laughs> I love both very much, and um, yeah, I think you played it very well, and. At the uh, end, in the coda, one could even discuss when it uh, suddenly uh, uh, goes to F A flat major, just some bars before the end. Maybe one would be allowed um, to take a, a little bit less tempo, just to let the sound uh, flow and, and, and let the sound uh, work in A flat major. But um, well, we talked very often about this. For such decisions, we should have we should have the telephone number of Beethoven. <laughs> and uh, maybe if the digitalization in the world goes on, maybe someday we have it. And uh, I have a long list of questions I will ask him in my very first call to him. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your wonderful performance. And 
uh, for your emotion and uh, for the power you worked on it. And uh, it is a pleasure to listen. Thank you. Thank you.